Uh, I was saying that I'm a researcher at IRD, which is a French institute for uh, development research, and I also wanted to say that um, as a Latin American scholar, I have been um, working in Spanish and Portuguese over, over the last two decades, so English is not my, my strong language. So please do not hesitate to interrupt me if anything should be unclear, okay? So, um, I will bring you to Brazil, uh, and more specifically to the world of Brazilian women farmers committed to agroecology, trying to make a contribution to the understanding of uh, ecological challenges from below. I will uh, try to show you what um, the shift to the standpoint of these women uh, will mean or could mean for our understanding of ecology. Um, on, the, on the left side, you can have a glimpse at some of these women. Here it's a local group in a region of, uh, of Brazil called Valle do Ribeira, which is a forest region. And on the right side, you have a glimpse at the kind of products that these women are producing. And as you can already observe, this is a fairly diversified range of product, which is an important point. So as an introduction, uh, I would like to show you a, a few more pictures in order to, for you to, uh, to feel the very different forms and levels of, agro of commitment of these women to agroecology. On the first picture, you can see a practice. Um, this woman, uh, which is so-called Quilombola woman, which means a descendant of black slave, is, uh, is doing some kind of soil fertilization with earthworms in order to avoid to apply uh, chemical fertilizers. And for her, of course, it's a kind of committed practice to the environment. On uh, the second picture, you can see uh, one of those local uh, groups of women farmers and here they are doing some collective work, which is called Muchiron in, in Brazil, which is a way to, to encounter each other and to uh, make some tasks, to perform some agricultural tasks together, mm -hmm. such that it would be difficult to be done uh, if alone or only at family level. And I can already say that this group of women are also organized to, to sell their products at some uh, solidarity economy fairs, and they are also committed to the broader uh, political movement on of, of agroecology. And, uh, and, and precisely on the, on the third picture, uh, which was taken in, in August this year in Brasilia, you can see the broadest um, mobilization, uh, mass mobilization of women farmers, which is called Marcha das Margaridas, and which has gathered up to 100,000 women farmers in Brasilia since the year 2000. So Marcha das Margaridas is happening most of all, every four or five years, and um, is about the rights of these women, social rights, economic rights, and public policies in support to uh, agroecology and family farming. So we can already understand that there are many scales involved in the issue of this women's commitment to agroecology and very different forms to from uh, being uh, an agriculture and being uh, someone marching in the, in the, in the city of Brasilia. But before uh, going further, uh, just let me tell you what I understand with agroecology, which is a rather broad term. Agroecology, in the more narrow definition, uh, refers to a range of practice and knowledge. That's a seminal work of Miguel Alcieri and Stephen Glissman, which will speak of an ecologiza ecologization of agriculture in the, in the sense of inserting the agricultural production into ecological processes at the level of soils, of trees, of animal breeding, of biodiversity. So it's a way to, to work together with natural processes in order to, to get some food production. A second point, very important, is that agroecology is food-oriented. It's about producing food and not, for example, uh, biofuels or other types of production which are not... Okay. 
um, oriented towards, towards food. And the third point in this more narrow definition of agroecology it has, is that it is an encounter between peasant and scientific knowledge. Um, peasant knowledge for a long time has been considered backward, it has been de delegitimized, and now agroecology is a kind of re-legitimization <coughs> of this kind of empirical knowledge from peasants. And scientific knowledge on agriculture is a very um, productivist dominated knowledge uh, in, in agronomical um, courses. <laughs> and agroecology appears as a dissident science within agronomy. So it's an encounter for dissident knowledge in the academy and peace knowledge which has long been uh, considered as insignificant or unproductive, backward, irrational and so on. But now there is a broader, a more political uh, definition of agroecology, which is the one that I will refer to in this presentation. In this sense, Agroecology is also a political economy and a social movement. It is a social a movement which has uh, his subject um, in uh, some figures are like women, peasants, traditional communities, indigenous communities, the so-called quilombola communities in the case of Brazil, as I said rapidly, people who consider themselves as descendants of the black slaves. So what these people have in common is that they are reproducing life in the sense of feminist sociology, reproducing life in the sense of being the devaluated basis of capitalist production, of being those who will produce food and reproduce ecosystem and take care of them and be responsible at the end for the reparation of the damage of capitalism. So that's no uh, casualty if you encounter those people which were, were responsible for the reproduction of life as being the subject of agroecology. It's kind of reclaiming a place in the social and economic system. So it's important uh, for a feminist view and agroecology to have this more political reading because agroecology is not just about technique, it's also about social relation, it's about political economy. And um, last but not least, as you will see uh, across my presentation, uh, <coughs> agroecology is multiscalar in uh, many dimensions. First of all, in the ecological dimension, there is no sense of having uh, agroecology only at your property level. You will, be, you will be affected by, for example, pesticides, contamination from uh, the, the broader territories, but also from an economic, uh, political economy point of view, um, agroecology being a, a, a social and economic construct, it is only possible if you have the right scales articulated in order to be able to, to value your production, to organize some fairs, to, to lobby on the, uh, the, the public policies that will be useful to you or at the contrary that will be damageful to you. So agroecology is from the local to the national and global level and on the, on the opposite too. So from, from this uh, first point of introduction, you may understand that um, ecology or agroecology more specifically is um, moving the lines in matters of engagement or of commitment. If we, speak, if we are speaking of ecological commitments, we can understand that here we have new subjects and they are subaltern. They are the ones who are producing lives, they are the ones suffering social, envir so social environmental injustice. Um, so they are subjects which are not the one that you normally um, think of when speaking of political engagement. There are no um, workers, urban workers, there are no middle class workers defending social rights, but there are very subaltern groups fighting for reproducing their lives and defining some kind of environment. And that would be an important point to understand what environments are they defending. And then we have also, uh, you may feel that we have also, we are confronted with different forms of organization and of commitments. Some forms which are actually rather informal. Uh, those people at some times they are involved, for example, in 
who were workers' unions and some kind of more um, formal organization, but many times are only groups, collective networks connected to one another according to necessity and the capillarities of the people who are part of, of this, uh, of this uh, movement. Um, a th third point that we will come back to, of course, is that we have gendered levels uh, and spaces of participation, which means that you will not encounter women and men at the same places, at the same levels of these movements. Um, and that's also a point that we will be coming back to. And, and fourthly, we have to realize the violence of, uh, of the, the context we are speaking of. The whole agroecological movement in Brazil is exposed to very, very rough uh, social environmental conflicts, to agrotoxics, to mining, green economy. I will come back to that too, but I will just insist from the introduction that we are speaking of very, very, uh, yes, violent context. So where, where I am speaking from, I'm <laughs> speaking from the data of uh, a project which is called Gengibre, which is financed through the French National Research Agency um, and which is called, uh, the, the longer name is Relationship with Nature and Gender Equality, Feminist Mobilization and Practices in Agroecology in Brazil. This project is quite broad. It's interdisciplinary between social sciences and agriculture. There are about 17 uh, colleagues working at, it, at this project at the moment. Uh, I, am, I am the coordinator of the project, but today I'm here more as a researcher <laughs> to share with you um, a part of, of this result, part which is related with engagement. Um, we have a feminist intersectional analysis standpoint, which means that, uh, that we pay attention to the intersection between gender, class, racial relations. And it's a brazil uh, friends collaboration involving university and research institute, but also two Brazilian NGOs. And six of these women farmers groups, I will not go into detail, but it's important to say that it is also an engaged research. <laughs> We are committed to agroecology as researchers and we work with the co-construction of research issues and data and um, with different levels of uh, devolution and the construction of agroecology as researchers too. Um, you may have a, a look at our websites and um, you can in particular see the full team. Uh, there are so many people I won't be able to, to tell you all the names, but what I'm going to present is not my personal research, but a broader one. So um, just to be very brief, we have uh, data in this project at three main levels. I think our main effort is to get some very invisible data at the micro level to be very close to these women farmers, many of them black women, uh, indigenous women or women from uh, very poor uh, social classes. So it's a big effort of our team to be close to them, uh, to also be able to make some contribution to their life from our research, which is a condition that they will spend some, some of their, their time to participate into our research. And uh, we have data, very, very deep data on 30 women and, and what we call the man of the house, which is of course a <laughs> feminist joke about <laughs> household women. So we have household men. And um, we have some uh, so-called feminist ethnomapping, which is a way to understand the um, space of life and work of this woman from their own point of view. Uh, to understand the ways that they, they look at their practices in agroecology, the ways they describe what they do, the ways they speak of the plants, of the, of the, the animals that they are breeding. So it's a, a way to, to get into their world. So that's feminist ethnomapping. We have interviews and questionnaires with both men and women. And at that level, what we are doing is basically trying to understand farming practices embedded into gender relations. Uh, then we have a second level, which is at the level of this women farmers collective or groups. And there we do some kind of social cartography. 
and some kind of, we call it, river of life, of the territory by which we mean a way to understand the history of one territory which is not necessarily linear, so it's not a, li a timeline with one thing happening after the other, but it's a more curved history with some obstacles, some moment that you go backward and then you make a, a bigger way and then something happens, so a way to, to understand history which is not linear. And here we basically apprehend the territory in, in gender, class and racial relations. Mm -hmm. And then we have a broader level to understand territories in relation with the many actors who, dispar who, dispar who, who, who fight for this territory with very uh, opposite views. And there we speak with people from the agribusiness and people from the mining sectors and from the green economy and political um, um, uh, people in, in, the, in, the, in, in the government, etc. So that's a way that we get a broader view to the subject. So at some point of my presentation, I will, I will come back to some of this data. I just wanted to, to give you first an overview. So the outline of my presentation, it will have four main parts, uh, which are all um, about some very simple question, but not so easy answer. First of all, committed to what? Secondly, committed from what social position? <coughs> and then how does, that, does commitment happen? And lastly, coming back to the question, committed against whom? And then a conclusion. So we try to, to get into their world with this, that simple questions. So committed to what? <laughs> Which ecology or agroecology are we talking about? Um, here I will show you a few, few pictures again of the kind of things that cis women are committed to. The first one here on, on the left side are the kind of projects that the, the women are proud of. This is from a post in a WhatsApp group of, of one of these women's collectives. And one of them would post that kind of picture just to show what she's producing and everyone would say, wow, great, that's nice. <laughs> so why is it, why is it nice? <laughs> it's because it's healthy, agroecological agro food and also cultural food. In Brazilian, they said comida de verdade, a true food, not a false food industrial. On the second picture, um, you can see a woman's vegetable garden. Here we have some cabbage and lettuce and kind of of foods that you so eat every day. And um, here on the, on the background, you can see some, some coffee plantation. And that kind of coffee plantation is actually monoculture. And that's the husband of this woman um, planting coffee with <coughs> chemical pesticides and fertilizers. So for her, uh, her commitment is to defend her place, her little vegetable garden, mm -hmm against the expansion of that cash crop, which is coffee uh, monoculture. So you see, it's very everyday environmental, environmentalism, reproducing life. On the, third, um, on the third picture here, another aspect which is very important in, in one of the regions where I work, I just realized uh, that I forgot to tell you that we're working in two regions, sorry. One is Zona da Mata in Minas Gerais, and the other one is um, Valle do Ribeiro, uh, Valle do Ribeira in São Paulo. And in, in Minas Gerais, particularly, we have very strong mining processes uh, occurring. So mining is a, a, a constant um, preoccupation for, for uh, family farming. So here on, on this sign, um, translated into English, you can read for our waters, agroecology, and future and future generations, no mining here. So um, this speaks about being exposed every day to uh, some kind of pressure for mining companies to to buy to buy and actually to invade the territory of family farming. And this, this kind of signs have been installed by a group of women farmers in that community, which has been. Um, has been exposed to, you call it drone, drone, kind of, um, uh, yes, to drone from a mining company making some kind of mapping of, of the places in order to, to make some very, very big project of mining. 
Um, another example which has to do with screen economy, and in here it's um, a citation for a, a discussion group of women farmers, uh, which, has, which, which, which is actually from a former project, but it's, it's very much actual. So uh, the first one was actually a, a leader, a local leader, uh, says to the other women, a company that was committing itself here, you know, to recovering degraded area and improving the air. Improving the air is the way that she perceives uh, carbon captation projects. So the project, the company was, in, was involved to improving the air. They came up with some crazy ideas. Everyone would take an area and plant some plants that they would treat with some other inputs, wire, hydrogel, and leave the area. Then everyone in the community said they were not going to plant any plants from outside. We were going to be paid to open it and fence it off for 50 reais, which is a very small amount. Then everyone said that was, there was no problem in recovering these degraded areas, except that afterwards you would not be able to harvest anything to plant another variety. At certain meetings, they said we could, then suddenly another technician turned up. We had five technicians in one year. They appeared and disappeared, said another one. They, they were a pain in the house until 2013. Then we understood better. And then the community decided to exclude this kind of project and to uh, decline the, the offer to, to make some uh, payment for carbon captation. So that's another kind of project which is happening in the community and basically uh, they are proposing to plant some trees with seeds from outside. So there are no trees that are growing normally in the place. They are uh, quickly growing trees in order to, 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 to make com uh, carbon compensation and they, are, they would be implemented in a modality that would be a concession and exclude any other use of the land from the community. So that's also the kind of project that these women are committed against. So what are they doing? What's the common point between this kind of very different threat to the territories? These women, and, and also some men in, in the community, of course, will come back to it, are defending their life and their environment mm. on a local scale. That's a, that's a point, that's a, that's a common mm. point to, to all examples. It's played at a attachment, but it's also a kind of uh, um, a very pragmatic response to how to defend their life and their environment, and insist on their environment. They are not defending the environment, but their environment which is necessary to reproducing their life. And they are exposed to some social environmental conflicts, which are basically in, the, in both the region we are working on, on three dimensions, agrotoxins, agrotoxins and transgenics, which mean the agriculture model, mining, and then the green economy, which mean broadly the commodification of nature in different form here, for example, the concession for the captation of carbon. So it's important to realize why they're engaging and also the limits of engagement. When it's not on their territory, when it's not affecting the life, they will not engage <laughs> for some things that's not in their, in their direct um, um, territory. Because uh, it's not firstly a moral issue, it's firstly a, an issue of reproducing life. And we are speaking of women who are extremely overloaded with work so they will not attend a meeting on global climate change, for example, which is not affecting themselves. So it's, it's useful to, to understand their own logics. Um, here I just have a, a first look at one of the, of the maps that we are producing in the project. It's a kind of, cat I'm, I'm going to make a zoom, but first let's first explain. <laughs> it's a kind of, uh, of cartography that we are producing with the women farmers which represents uh, the social economic impact, uh, such, uh, so social environmental impacts and the, the resistance in their territories. So we are doing this kind of, of mapping at the community level. Here you see uh, many communities for one district of one municipality, so it's a very local, local level. And here, for example, we have a, a Zoom uh, from one of these communities, which is called Saint-Simon-de-Hilpreto. 
I will I will here insist on the on the second line, which is about the stress that they are suffering, which are contamination in that in that, in that case from cafe fertilizers, which is um, the the how do you call it pumping water. Water is being pumped out in order to uh, to be used for mining. Uh, so, uh, um, mining trade, and uh, they also associate this with machismo and the lack of autonomy for women and violence against women. In that particular case, they explain that the, uh, the presence of many men <coughs> working from the mining companies mm. are, have uh, considerably um, increased violence mm. against women. Um, uh, pregnancy for teenagers, prostitution, and the insecurity for women to be on the streets. Um, and on the first line, um, they also speak about their resistances, which has a lot to do with um, different form of cultural manifestations with the organization in, in agroecology through a local organization called REGI uh, Network, and uh, through uh, the uh, political organization and the unions, and in particular <coughs> the fight for, for lunch. And finally, to uh, oops, women organization in a cooperative that sells them their products. So I just want you to, to have a, a more concrete idea of um, what are they committed to. They are committed to the environment, again, some very concrete threats that, that affect that particular territory and they are articulating different dimension of resistance in order to, to be able to, to respond to this kind of threats. So, um, have you have some questions so far? Are you able to understand me, more or less? Yes. The English is very fine, I think. I'm more than fine. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm not very comfortable, but I'm trying. <laughs> Okay, so, but if you if you tell me that I'm um, you can understand me, so I'm I'm going to be more confident. So commitment from what social position and the subtitle women farmers a thorn in the side of feminists that uh, <laughs> a, a quite um, delicate uh, a quite interesting point. So let's let's have a look first at some data. The women we are speaking of, uh, um, I call them some women farmers, but they are. First of all, mothers, they are healers, they had midwives, and that's a standpoint they are speaking of. So let's have a look at some citation of them. Um, the first one is what from um, so-called Protocolo uh, Biocultural. It's a kind of, um, of, of a resume or presentation of uh, the community from a, 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 a cultural and biological point of view and it's a kind of making the community recognize so it's that kind of document the, the people of the community will speak about what's important for them in the community and here they will speak um, precisely about midwife and healer as I say, the community's inhabitants fondly remember Dona Veronica, a midwife and healer who was well known for her spirituality and faith and for being a reference in the community's health care through teas, prayers, blessings and rituals. So that's an important point for the identity of the community. And you can also notice that this woman is connecting cheese which means um, herbs and uh, she's uh, doing some some remedy with herbs and prayers which is spiritual blessing which is also spiritual and ritual which is at the border between spirituality and culture um, then as a, a, a woman farmer speaking about seeds it's a good feeling of exchanging seeds i think it means confronting mining the more we exchange, diversifying the territory, the more we create resistance. So it's very strong affirmation because a seed is something so so little, so small, to to be resisting with in in comparison with mining projects which are so so big and so destructive. Yes. In this, um, relating to this, I wanted to ask from your research and field work, what do you think is the 
or was the position of women in this community before these interventions, before agriculture, before say mining? And the reason I ask is that it, you talk about, and we talk a lot about um, violence against women or the subjugation of women by these big forces under um, all, all these colonial, I don't know, or colonial interactions, but there is also a very romantic idea that somehow indigenous communities were a lot more egalitarian, and in my understanding, that is not always accurate. Yeah. So, in this community, what was your um, what what do you think about that from your perspective? yes? We we, ha we we're facing very patriarchal context before and after, <laughs> and now. <laughs> So we, we are facing very strong inequalities and um, we should avoid uh, any romanticization of, of these communities. They are by no ways egalitarian, far from that, yes. Maybe what, what these big projects and, and uh, agroecology as a political movement is doing to these communities is a kind of women's empowerment in the communities that have resisted because there are many of them which have not resisted and then we have migration and loss of identity and empowerment and, 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 and people getting more uh, poor and poorer. So we are far away from any kind of romanticization. I, I agree. And do you think that some of these, um, that they have been enhanced or some of the ideas of gender equality are actually coming from exposure to Western ideas? Or do you think that doesn't, it would be you know, better in, in Brazilian, um, we have a, a strong movement of, of uh, a strong women movement. I, w I won't call it feminist at first, but we have a, a strong women movement in, in, in rural areas since the ages. So it's kind of endogenous uh, women's movement, which for some long time have been distanced from more urban feminism. It's not so much the question Western and and Brazilian and I would rather say urban and rural, which is which is which have some common some common uh, points. But um, it's 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 a long process for these women to recognize to denaturalize their position, and that's exactly the point I would be uh, I would want to come to. So maybe just have a look at the date and then um, and then we will we'll be able to, to discuss this time. But that's one of the lines I would like to, to bring that I'm happy about you to, to make that question. Thank you. So the third one is uh, from a woman farmer who's participating into one of this uh, collective um, commercialization group and she's saying, selling our products to get our money and help out around the house giving satisfaction for what we spent, and that makes us happy, which goes through our whole body, and another joy is eating our projects with a healthy and fresh woman farmer. So here we can, <laughs> can see some kind of positive affirmation about the position of being a woman, being the one who, nourish, who is nourish, nourishing, giving some food to the other, so a kind of Yes, positive value to, to, to motherhood, to, to being a woman, but we have to, 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 to question that. And the, the, the last one, which is a m much more problematic um, dimension or aspect, is the following. With my first child, I had a postpartum depression. At the first time, I was on the board of the STR, which is a local rural workers' union. I couldn't let go of work. I felt that if I left, everything would stop happening. I felt judged in many ways for giving up the STR and also for not prioritizing the pregnancy and the child. So here we come into obligation and the, the weight of social rules and norms. So what I, I want to, to, to draw your attention to, what the common point, why the common logic between all this affirmation? It's uh, the, the, the logic of care, of caring for others, of caring for the nature, which is a social responsibility assigned to women. 
So we have a continuum, the common point between seeds and healing with chi and spiritualities and <coughs> being overloaded with work is that these women are caring for different things, that they're responsible for care work. So <coughs> here in, 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 in the special um, uh, field of agroecology, this means concretely cooking and recycling food waste and breeding animals and growing plants and tree and fertilizing the soil and collecting medicinal plants which are all interrelated aspects of, of agroecology. It's also engaging into local organizations where this kind of way to make agriculture will be defended. So that's a continuum of practices along the line of caring for others, for nature, from the very basic practice in your, in your field to some more orga organizational spaces. And as your, uh, as, um, what's your name? Kananjita or already brought, uh, it is an issue. Uh, care is an issue. Care is not um, a natural responsibility. It's not a fine uh, work. It's a complicated uh, matter. So, uh, as I already, already said, it's a continuum of practices from those in the agroecology to food preparation, to health, to motherhood, and also to resistance. So it's a positive aspect, but at the same time, uh, it's obligatory and it's socially assigned to women. So we, we have to, to see the different aspect of it as being something that is meaningful and something that is an obligation. It's an ethic, it's a relation, but it's also work. And that means many, many times work overload and it's bring to, to, to the discussion, the issue of the, divis the sexual division of labor. So care is the place these women are making agroecology, but it's a complicated place. Um, and to go one step further, I want to, to bring the idea that, that's, that care is the only possible place for these women to to make any kind of commitment, commitment to agroecology, but actually any kind of action from then can only start from this place in society, which is a place which is assigned to them. So it's not possible to imagine that, to imagine that, that this woman would engage into ecology from a different standpoint. They are only <laughs> with that possible identity and place in society. So many times we, we face a debate on essentialism, meaning that people will, and mostly that kind of Western, more urban feminist will disagree with that kind of, of position. They will say that we are falling one time again in the naturalization of women, that meaning that we are assuming for natural uh, all the work that they are doing to repair uh, the bodies to repair the world and that we are not empowering this woman but reproducing more of the same kind of unequal position for this woman. But the point is <laughs> we are not empowering this woman but these women are empowering themselves from the unique position that they detain. So there, there is no, um, there's no other places or the starting position for them to, to commit to any kind of engagement. So that's a point I, I want to make um, and I want maybe to, to be a little bit provocative and to um, ask you if finally um, the, the line between uh, um, a more political engagement, that, that kind of essentialism, which is oft, often um, uh, critica, uh, criticized by, by feminists is so clear. Is it so clear when, when you see a woman who's saying, I'm engaged for my position as a mother, as a spouse, as a healer, as a midwife, and today it's a political engagement for me, and I feel empowered. I mean, uh, who am I to tell her that she's not empowered? So. <laughs> <laughs> it's also a, a matter of power relation between different currents of, of feminism. 
Um, there are several debates around that. Uh, Spivak, in, which is a, 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 an important figure of subaltern studies, introduced a term of strategic essentialism to say exactly that, that people uh, may use essentialism as a strategy mm -hmm. and the, one, the only one which is possible. Uh, Ecofeminism also with uh, here in, in India and Germany, Maria Mies and Vandana Shiva, or in France, Jeanne Burga, have pointed very well that point that there is not such a strong divide between so-called essentialist ecofeminism and constructivist ecofeminism, but actually it's blurred. <laughs> and wh when you're on the field, you never know whether this woman is strategic or essentialist, whether she is political or totally immersed in her motherhood. So maybe it's ultimately a false, false, deb a false debate to some, to some extent. But what I, I want to maybe you to, to keep as a key idea is that there's no, mm -hmm. and there's no, and no, there's no other places for this woman to, to make a commitment to ecology. So coming to the third point, uh, how does commitment happen? So uh, I'm going he here to, to, to move to uh, a little bit different ideas of uh, multidimensionality. I'm coming back to, to, the, to the beginning of the presentation when I was saying there is practice and there is some kind of political economy and then some kind of politic being made from below to some mass mobilization and we have to understand how these different, different dimensions are working together. So here, um, some pictures again um, were from some kind of feminist popular education, as they are called in Brazil, very much in the light of the Brazilian pedagogist uh, Paulo Freire from popular education. Um, here the women uh, are, are drawing uh, the, 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 the ways, the routes that the, the truck carrying their products will, um, will, uh, will drive in order to pick up the products from every group of women farmers and bring them into the state of Sao Paulo. And here they are doing a kind of, they are building a model of the ideal um, 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 uh, marketplace uh, that they, they would like to construct and it's interesting because they are putting food but also some kind of handcraft and a place for, child, so for the children to be cared of and so they are bringing together um, what would be their, their ideal worlds. So uh, what I want to, 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 to show is that um, education, uh, that kind of popular feminist education, plays a central role in politicization. politicization. The moment when, where maybe we, 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 um, we get out of essentialism and we begin to have some, some more political view, uh, reflexive view of this women farmer on themselves, on the way and the place, that they occupy in society are at this kind of, of uh, meetings uh, 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 geared towards education. Um, that's the places where private issues become public. Right? Well, as a feminist long said, that's the moment when women farmers will say, oh, uh, all, all, all that knowledge that you are call, that you are calling agroecologics, that's actually what my mother <laughs> always um, taught to me. That's the kind of knowledge that I thought was backward. That's the kind of knowledge that I thought I was um, maybe one of the last one <coughs> to, to, to have them. And now I'm discovering that um, there are other uh, women farmers and men farmers too who have this kind of knowledge. I am discovering that there are some scientific uh, at the university called agroecologists agro working on that, of that kind of knowledge. So that's a moment of politicization, politic politicization in the sense of, of discovering the particular as being collective and as being political. Um, that on the, on the dimension of agroecology, but also very much on the dimension of being a woman. That's the moment where the whole work of reproducing life, the whole work of caring for others is recognized as being 
politics as being the basis of the capitalist system as being much more than just surviving but actually repairing the world and playing uh, um, an essential role and an essential role in the war economic and political system so this is done with political elites um, which are uh, that kind of NGOs working with feminism and agroecology which are also these political leaders from inside the women's uh, movements and it's a, a very big connection, a ne network, as I was saying at the beginning, between different parts of that, that, uh, that, that broader uh, ecological movement. That's what uh, we can call uh, local public spaces. Uh, th this is a term from the theory of solidarity economy in France, which has been proposed by Bernard M. and Jean-Louis Laville to speak of those very local spaces um, what, where you are doing something, there are practical spaces, you are doing economy, you are selling, you are producing, but at the same time, you are democratizing, you are discussing about uh, economic relations, about economic inequalities, and on the concrete and practical way to overcome uh, these inequalities. So it's political, it's political from below. Um, you can also relate to Nancy Fraser's theories, uh, democratical theories, and the concept of subaltern counterpublics, which mean uh, oppositional uh, spaces, those kind of spaces where you can, uh, where the subaltern speak, uh, again speaking like Spivak, <laughs> where the subaltern can develop some oppositional ideas to the dominant system and begin to to organize in order to, to overcome some kind of inequalities. So that kind of educational spaces are key uh, for developing agroecology and commitments from the basis of these women farmers. Yet, there will be nothing without a political economy organization, which I call solid solidarity economy or solidarity-based economy. There are many forms of it. Uh, here are a few pictures again. The first one is uh, from a broader project oops, in Brazil, which was, called, which was called Agroecological Notebooks, Cadernetas Agroecologicas, um, which, are, which was about um, the women farmers registering all their production, the monetary and the non-monetary production, the market production and the non-market production. Concretely, it's, it's a very simple instrument which has just four columns, uh, which is the, the production which is self-consumed, the one which is bartered, so it's non-monetary non and non-market, donated, same thing, and the, the production which is sold at some marketplace. And it is a very powerful instrument for these women to realize the value of everything that they are producing. It's very powerful that this woman would realize that they are not just helping their families, as it is normally said to them, and they repeat this, this phrase, I'm not a worker, I'm just helping my family. And saying I'm not a worker means that they have no rights, they are nobody. So suddenly to see the, oh, the, the total value, the, the total equivalent monetary value of my production it's like one salary. It's a very powerful instrument. So that's a kind of, 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 of instrument that, that, that are needed really to, to build commitment to agroecology in order to justify, to legitimize what they are doing, to give in value to it, to make some, some visibility to the work of these women. And then on the more classical uh, dimension of, of uh, monetary production, we have the social organization of different kinds of markets. Here, for example, in the second picture, we have uh, a, a young man uh, who is selling some solidarity baskets, Sesta Solidaria, uh, from a network of consumers groups in, in Sao Paulo. That's the one with at the at the end point of the, of the tracks, at the, the woman <laughs> on, the, on the picture before were designing, so he's receiving the projects and, and he and the group he's belonging to are organizing some, some baskets of the production and selling them to fair <coughs> prices. 
And then you have uh, um, a big array of uh, so-called femini feminist solidarity economy marketplaces here, for example, one in Sao Paulo where some uh, of the farmers will pick up the products of the group and they will alternate to be there and to, to, sold, to sell the product to, to fair prices on the fair. So it's important uh, from a theoretical point of view to, to recognize economy in the sustainable sense, for example, in the key of Karl Polanyi, not just market economy, not just market value, but more broader social value of the, of the world production what we call a, a plural approach to the economy, recognizing reciprocity, <coughs> redistribution, householding as legitimate economic principles. And it's very important to, to recognize the collective and political dimension of the, eco of the economic construction that sustain agroecology. Without a proper economic support to agroecology, there will be no agroecology, <laughs> simply because people won't sustain. So. It's, it's basic. So coming back to the, to the, to the question, um, <coughs> how do they commit to agroecology? It's a multidimensional and multi-level process which connects education as politi politicization, the resignification of, agroecolog of agroecological work, recognizing themselves as doing some kind of agroecology, exchanging knowledge, strengthening practice, which meant that agroecology is not static, it's always um, in movement through the exchange of technical knowledge, seeds, how to do that, how to resolve, to resolve that problem with some kind of predators, damage, um, etc. Et and it's also places where they are building solidarity, economy, relationship, and spaces. And the, the, the picture of the, of the women building their, their model for a, ma a fair marketplace. Then the dimension of uh, economy, in that case, solidarity economy is the key one. That's the monetary and social valuation of the work of these women and of these men also reproducing life and that's economic sustainability and legitimacy. For many, many women, the moment when they began to be recognized and accepted in the family uh, with a project of women farmers in agroecology is when they brought an income into the house. <laughs> Very simple. That's the moment where, oh, Okay, oh, so it's working. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's very, very important. And of course, uh, agroecology uh, in practice, uh, it's a material, the ecological bias, basis, but it's also, also a matter of identity, of defining oneself as an agroecological uh, woman farmer is uh, a matter of, of, of being someone and, and stopping to being no one. And um, yes, it's multi-scale or multi-level from the field to economic and political networks from local to more broader levels. So um, let's just have a, a look again on one of, of our maps here. I, was, I want to, to show you the connection of this different dimension of, uh, of building the commitment. Here we are in, in one uh, municipality called Barra do Turvo. And on the left side, you can see what the women have identified as being the main spaces of resistance and the main dimensions. So the dimension, dimension of identity, <coughs> so-called quilombola identity, again, it's about being descendant of black slaves, which for them means also a way to practice agriculture, uh, which is very cultural. And then they will bring the fact of doing agroforestry. Agro so they are um, uh, in one of the regions of, of rainforest. Um, they will bring also the fact of breeding animals and um, and preparing food from the from the uh, from the, the crops. The third one here is about um, caring uh, caring the nature and themselves to agroecology, and they also um, emphasize that they are fighting for social rights and the territory very much as quilombola. They are organizing for production and commercialization, as we have seen, and they are selling their own pro products. So what's, what's interesting for me in this example is the interrelation between the dimension. Commitment appends 
exactly because uh, these connections exist. Where there is not such, such connection, there is no agroecology. Agroecology is not just one person uh, producing differently in, in his field. Agroecology is a movement, is a collective movement which articulates, which connects all those dim dimensions. And that's exactly what they are bringing to, to our social cartography. So the last point, um, committed against whom? Um, we release projects from the territory to the bedroom. <coughs> so <laughs> I'm going to come back to some of the straits that we, that we identified at the beginning about agrotoxins and mining and yes, agrotoxins and mining. So um, here one of the very typical landscape of the, the region of Zona da Mata in Minas Gerais, which is coffee landscape, coffee as a monoculture. So you have, I don't know if you know that Brazil since two, two centuries have been the first um, uh, uh, export uh, uh, country for coffee. Um, today it has about uh, one third of total uh, po production worldwide. And um, coffee is also the second uh, most traded material, uh, raw material after peach oil. So coffee is a huge business. And Minas Gerais is the first region, the first state in Brazil exporting coffee. And Zona da Mata is the main region, is Minas Gerais. So we have coffee everywhere. Coffee in monoculture, which means uh, chemical fertilizers and pesticides, um, transgenic seeds in some places, and global markets uh, with very strong fluctuations and a lot of impacts on, on uh, the livelihoods of these families. But wh what's, what's interesting here is to understand what means coffee from a more intimate point of view. So I will show you what one of this uh, so-called feminist ethnomapping I was mentioning at the beginning, which is a view uh, from, the, from the woman farmer in her uh, own place, so all, uh, places where she and, 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 and her family are cultivating. So here we are in Minas Gerais, and the wall uh, um, drawing on the left side represents um, the place of life and work of one family. And all the trees that you can see from the top to the bottom here, from the left to the right, they are coffee plantations. So you can see that the main part of the, of the, of the, of the land of this family is taken by coffee. Here on the bottom, there is no coffee just because it is very wet. That's what we call in the region Brejo. It's near the river, so it's not apt for coffee. And then here, this little place, and here you have a zoom on this little place, is the place around the house and the place of the woman. And in this very little place, what you cannot read because it is very, very small, it's the diversity of products that she is drawing. Um, <clears throat> We have, we have uh, mapped about 50 different products that this woman is growing in a very, very small space because all the space is taken up by coffee. Um, so we have here uh, a very, <laughs> very impacting design or very impacting drawing of the confrontation of coffee monoculture and agroecology. She is doing agroecology around the house in a very small space and he is doing, her man, her husband, he's doing coffee monoculture in the rest of the, of the land. We have some, um, some stickers on the drawing. Um, um, some of them are purple and that the, that the places where the woman is working. So that the, those places around the house here and she's also working a little bit on the plantation of coffee, of co on the coffee plantation. It's actually at the moment of, of harvesting the coffee, which involves all, all, all the family. And we have some uh, gray stickers, which are the places where the man is involved, and it's mostly in the coffee. So we have a strong division of labor. Uh, a, a sexual division of labor between men and women, which is very typical of the region. And we have uh, a strong uh, a sexual division of the agricultural space. So the, the, the land is divided between those places which are scared of by the women 
and those places uh, which are under the responsibility of the man. Um, <coughs> and in, in this particular place, um, the, the woman farmer is sick. She is sick from, uh, from the, the, um, the chemical pesticides which are affecting her, uh, her breathing. She has pulmon, called pulmon? Yes, she has, she has issues with breathing. She cannot breathe normally because of the, the air contamination due to, to chemical uh, fertilizer. So she's committed against the, the monoculture of café. She's committed against her own husband. So commitments in agroecology here uh, occurs un until the level of the bedroom. They are a very um, conflicting uh, couple, if you, if you want to. And I know if you remember the first picture that I show you with uh, the vegetable garden and the coffee, which is coming qu m most in the vegetable garden, that's from that property. And they call that border the fighting border, that where they fight about what is going to be cultivated. So women farmers are fa fighting until the bedroom against the monoculture and the contamination it's bringing for their environment and their own life. Um, in here I have um, what we, we call the river of life of one of the collectives and it's just an, extra an, extract, an extract from it, from the, the time span from 1970 to 2000 and oh I'm sorry I am um, in, instead of putting the English translation I've put it in French but anyway I will I will comment it um, just made a mistake yes it's a mistake um, okay so what's what's interesting it's interesting because you can see on a more collective level how coffee as a monoculture is coming into that community so here on the left side, um, IBC, this is a drawing of Kofim. Um, I have some trouble with the zoom. I cannot point to my... But while on the left side, on the, on the top of the, of the drawing, you can see a drawing of Kofim and IBC, Instituto, Brasil, Instituto Brasileiro, Brasileiro do Café, uh, which is a Brazilian coffee institute which introduced coffee as a monoculture in the region. And then you see electrification, which was also a key point in making some kind of modernization of agriculture in the region. And then um, the fact that women's in, uh, income decreased while men incomes were increasing. That's because the IBC would address only men considered as the, 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 the chiefs of the household and would propose some kind of technical assistance for the cultivation of, of coffee only to men. And then women's work, that kind of work around the house of, um, of food crop and not cash crop would be uh, devaluated, delegitimated. And then you can see some women organizing and they are organizing as a collective of women inside the, the local uh, workers union. And um, they are organizing from 1991 on against mining, which is all to coming to their territory. And they are organizing through as a church, which is one place which is assigned to women. So they are always organizing from those places who are assigned to them. But actually, they are doing some kind of political mobilization against the main social environmental strains of the territory. And in 2000, they are, um, they are funding their own collective, the so so-called women's collective in the local trade union, uh, not trade union, but workers union. And today, uh, uh, since almost 10 years, they are women president of that local uh, workers' union. So it's a history which is speaking of uh, the ways that these women are, are, uh, are building their mobilization from the very intimate level of getting coffee into their, <laughs> not their bedroom, at, but their, 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 their field, to the level of local organization. Last point on mining. Here again in, in Zona da Mata, it is a, a work called Bauxite, uh, which is the one which is used for extracting aluminum. And Bauxite is found uh, about three meters beneath uh, the soil, so it's very superficial work. 
and that has a, an important consequence, which is that it is, it is viable for mining companies to make some very small excavations. It's not that kind of huge mining that you might have seen in some, some uh, documentary, uh, which are on many hectares, but here <coughs> they are very small excavations and they are made on families' farmers' land. Here in the pictures, you are in a, in a, in a land of <coughs> a few hectares uh, belonging to some family farmers, and you have an excavation for the mining of bauxite just inside of it. And it is very important from, from the, the point of view of the social relation involved, because it means that the mining company mm. will negotiate directly with the family farmers. And in this case, it will negotiate with the man, which is again considered the head of household, exactly the same as in the case of coffee monoculture. So one who is uh, considered as being able, as being responsible for the, that kind of income generating project is a man, because generating income is considered a responsibility assigned to men, just the same as caring is assigned to women. So the political economy of mining, the political economy of monocultures is very, high, is very highly gendered and it is always directed to men as being responsible for generating an income. So in this case, um, uh, let, let's have a look at, the, at some citation from a man first, a man farmer, he says, my neighbor received an offer from the mining company at one dollar per ton of clay for extracting bauxite. He turned it down because he thought it wasn't much. He could have become rich in his place and would have accepted. And it's a strong citation because it speaks of two things. Um, it speaks of the possibility which is offered to men to become rich and of the injustice which is made to that very uh, low-class men, peasant men, inside a value chain uh, where they are occupying the last place. So he's like a moral dilemma. Yes, on one side I would have become rich, richer than I am, richer than my woman, I get the money, that's nice. But on the other side, hmm, okay, mm -hmm. I, 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 I notice that the offer is not so good, so I'm at the, at the very low end of that value chain. And that's what, um, what gender sociologists have called marginalized masculinity, meaning that place that men from lower social class occupy in relation to that kind of hegemonic masculinity, which in that case is represented to the mining company. So you, you understand that Extractivism, as we call it, extractivism uh, uh, in mining sector, extractivism also in, in the monoculture model of agriculture, is very gendered. It is using the men, it is using, using the men as a social group in order to, to penetrate the territories, it is offering money to men, it's putting men on the first line of modernization, and at the same time it's putting women on the forefront of the resistance to it. So here we understand why we have so many women in agroecology. It's because there are other uh, ways, other uh, proposals that have been made to men. And we understand why the conflicts are getting until the level of the bedroom. It's because this kind of political economy of extractivism would not be possible if it was not mobilizing the position of poor men in the territories and using them to implement their projects. So we are not speaking of a natural propension of women for caring, we are not speaking of a natural propension of men to destroy the environment, <coughs> but we are speaking of the very particular position that the economic system is putting them differently, gendered position. Um, I think I, I said almost everything, increase in men's income, the devaluation of women's work, it's working together. The moment where you expand coffee, for example, you, diminish, you are dis diminishing women's land for planting with agroecology. The moment that you are giving a concession for mining in your 
property, you are also diminishing the production of actually the whole family. Uh, also to say that the, the, the main farmers are the first who are exposed in their own bodies, exposed to cancer, to pesticides, exposed to accidents, to mining, so they are exposed, very much <coughs> exposed. Um, so they, they are marginalized masculinities, they are suffering. My, my point is not to say that women are beautiful mm -hmm. and men are, <laughs> are very bad, but to, to understand the interplay between class and gender relation um, and also racial relation, which are uh, happening at that uh, political economy. So um, the last point, very obvious, it's a very unequal relationship with agroecology. Extractivism is a uh, um, very powerful political economical elites and agroecology are social movements of subaltern subjects. So we have a very unbalanced uh, uh, relation of power. So to conclude, a uh, tentative overview and then we get back to, to, uh, to questions. To understand uh, women farmers' commitment to agroecology, we have to be multidimensional. We have to understand the ecological dimension of their commitment, the fact that they are, the, they are reproducing those lives that really matter to them, the fact that they are seek, seeking some kind of justice for their environment, for their territories, they are not assuming a moral ecology of every place, but really, really of their place and the scales where this environment and this territory is happening is of course politically constructed. It can be expanded particularly to that social movement that we have been speaking of. Economic dimension, it is basic. Um, uh, true solidarity-based political economy as a condition for commitment, as a material condition of valuing the work that is being done, monetary and also the social value, for example, that kind of agroecological agro notebooks where you will register the whole range of production, whether market or non-market. We have a plural economy where market is not absent, but is being re-embedded into social relations. Um, <coughs> that's not a point I have um, different today, but maybe we come back to it in the discussion. We have very different kind of markets in agroecology. And then it's a political dimension, uh, starting from caring as social position, position, which is the only one which is possible, using that kind of local public spaces or subaltern counter publics that we find particularly in feminist popular education. And there is a big challenge, I have not mentioned so far, but of building some intermediary spaces to those more institutive spaces of power. How do you speak to government? How do you intermediate with some more powerful actors? How do you get public policies? How do you do political lobby from that very basic uh, space that are constructing within the agroecological movements? Uh, political dimension, as I said at the beginning, which is cross cut to structural violence. Um, um, I mean, not only as a violence of agrochemical, but also uh, assassinations and um, the very risk of, of being a political leader in, in a country <coughs> like Brazil. And from a more, um, last, lastly, from a more theoretical point of view, um, What's, uh, what's um, the basis of my whole presentation is a standpoint feminist epistemology. I'm not speaking universally, I'm speaking from that particular places. I'm speaking from the experience of that woman. I'm speaking from a situated knowledge perspective and from an interdisciplinary approach uh, based on that project with different colleagues. Thank you very much. So we have been a little bit long, but now we have, can have almost 30 minutes for, for, for debate. Yes, please. for your presentation. My name is Paola, I am from Mexico, and I am starting my master thesis about the 
political participation of women in green extractivism projects in Mexico. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, this presentation was just perfectly matching my, my mm -hmm. research topic. I have many questions, but I just gonna keep it short because I don't want to monopolize the work. But, uh, so my two questions are the first one, I am really scared of falling into this essentialism of mm. women as the mm. ones responsible of carrying the change, mm -hmm. of taking care of the environment. So what would you recommend? Like, What parameters do I need to keep in mind to not do that in my research project, to not uh, fall into this idea of women are the ones responsible because they are the ones reproducing life, they are the, they are the ones taking, uh, carrying out the care work. Uh, especially because we are talking about uh, especially indigenous and uh, peace and women. And uh, my second question will be um, if you could provide us more insights about the concept of everyday environmentalism. Um, if you could recommend some authors, I will be mm. very, very grateful. Thank you. Okay. Right, hello, I'm Gabriel from Brazil. And uh, my question is, um, we have seen in Brazil a growing trend of monoculture and the expansion of fascism and very conservative uh, things. and. While the, move, the landless movement is very successful in growing and, and uh, fighting for women's rights, what is lacking at the moment for this demand from the landless movement to reach more national levels at the moment? Is it a lack of institutionalities that connect the social movements to the government at the moment mm -hmm. or Brazilian institutions? Because they're very big and very influential where they are. But seem to be losing that fight <laughs> mm -hmm. recently. Yes. Um, hello, uh, my name is Cara. I'm from Austria. Thank you very much for your presentation. I really, really enjoyed it. Uh, I was wondering if you could maybe elaborate a bit on the violence argument. And uh, you, you argued that there's a, a lot of structural violence, but I was wondering if you also uh, did some research on intra-household violence mm -hmm. and if uh, being a female farmer has an impact on that as well. Thank you. Yes. So maybe I can, I can begin with these three questions and then take a second round of, of questions. Yes. Thank you very much. Very, very, very good question. Paula, I would um, say do not be scared. <laughs> <laughs> but deconstruct, soci sociologize, um, observe. You, you have as a, I, I mean, there are two, two, um, two aspects in, in that issue of essentialism, that what the people say and what you report about them, what you analyze about them. So I would, I would assume that indigenous Mexican uh, women will very probably be on that same frontier between farm, uh, farming themselves as women and the one who care for and politicizing. Very probably it's impossible to, uh, <laughs> to, to, uh, um, to, to, to draw, uh, uh, um, what you call it, um, a strong line between what is essentialism and what is not. And I think that's not what you as an analyst uh, should aim for. I think your position is to uh, contextualize, to explain, to deconstruct the position that these women are occupying in the Mexican society. To put some perspective to it, to put it very surely into the sexual division of work, but also in that specific context to explain what are they considered to be responsible for in that context and how they use it in their political struggle. I think that's, that's your job and I'm sure you'll, you'll do it very well. <laughs> but you, you will not be able to, to make some strong uh, line where, where the social actors themselves do not. And 
Yes, I think that would be my <laughs> my advice to to contextualize, to sociologize, to to explain, to to give justice to what they are doing. Uh, about everyday environmentalism, um, there is a, a seminal work by Loftus. Um, I, I don't remember the title. I can Loftus. Um, can I work? But also here, uh, you, could, you should have a look at the work by Nathalie Blanc. I don't know if you know her already. She's the director of the Center for the Earth. You, you know her, you know Nathalie? Okay, so just have a look at Nathalie's work. <laughs> but the, the, the key idea is really to understand um, environmentalism from the practice, from what people do and not from a moral standpoint, for example, from practice, from, for what matters in their everyday life. But you may also have a look at, you, you read French? No? <laughs> <laughs> well, for those of, okay, for, from those of you uh, reading French, you can have a look at, at Geneviève Prevost, uh, which is called Quotidien Politique which is a book which has been most discussed in French, Cotillon Politico, <laughs> um, which, which is about politics being made in, in, in everyday life. And uh, she has studied many um, ecological alternatives in French. But uh, I'm, I'm, I guess that some of her articles might be traduced at least in English. But her book, I think, no, it's a new book, it's in French only, but there are also other works of her. Yes, on the point of the landless movement in, in Brazil, um, the, the, the landless movement have been recognizing women's, um, women's position, women's reivindication from the, the 1990s, more or less, so it's uh, most two or three decades, and they have, yes, uh, participated in, into some important mobilizations. They have been part of the Marcha das, Mar das Margaridas that I was mentioning. But today, I, 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 I'm not a specialist of the landless movement, I, but I think that more than institutional, institu institutionality, what is <laughs> lacking is a, the, the political situation at the Brazilian parliament and government, it's very extremely difficult. I, I think you know that two, two days ago, the, uh, the, uh, the, the law projects uh, uh, liberalizing uh, many, many pesticides have been passed as a Senate. So it's just one illustration of the political uh, situation at the moment. So. Um, and uh, what's important just to illustrate that, that situation, that political situation, that law project has been passed on unanimity, which means with the, wor with the, with the, with the votes of the, 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 the deputies or the senators of the, of the workers' party. So it says a lot about uh, where the problem is. I think it's not so much institutionality than really it's, uh, the very, very difficult um, political relation about agroecology uh, and, and, and environments. I think there, are, there is a huge focus on, on deforestation in Amazonia, in the Amazonia, which is very important. But what's happening in the other regions, in the other biomes, and on the other environmental dimension is very, very um, concerning. And pesticides is... Um, is very uh, preoccupating at the moment. Uh, if you're interested, we have at the moment one, one brilliant researcher, she's called Larissa Bombardi, which was one of the specialists of, <coughs> of pesticides in Brazil. She's a geographer and she's in exile in France. She's, we, we, we served her, we have reserved, we received her as an exil professor because she's threatened in Brazil because of her political work on pesticides. Um, so that would be my, my answer, but we can, we can exchange later maybe. 
And Karen, it's Karen, yes, about violence. Yes, I, I spoke uh, very briefly about structural violence, but we have, yes, a continuum of violence which uh, reach until the household level, very certainly, yes. Um, women, women farmers explained very well how everything is interrelated from the levels of political assassination to that level that I briefly mentioned of uh, prostitution and and teenagers being pregnant to um, the penetration of mining in the territories to what we call molecular violence to the pesticides to that kind of violence which happens to in the bedroom in the in the in the household because men and women are pushed to very opposite economic models so um, i was joking that that couple um, call the frontiers between between their spaces, the, f the, 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 the front, the, the, the borders of fighting, they call it. <laughs> but that mean in many, in many cases, uh, uh, violence against women, which is really the expression of that strong inequality. So yes, there is very much was, some, for example, Kelly called a continuum of violence. Yes, we are observing that, no doubt. And we are, when we are making that kind of cartography with so the different dimension of threat, it's very striking that violence appears as one threat directly related in their experience to social environmental threat. So it's part of certainly in all levels. Yes. Are there other observations? Yes. Hi, uh, I'm Linda from the Netherlands. And I was wondering from the Netherlands. The Netherlands, yes. Yeah. Um, w what do you think uh, is the the role of, of w a women on the other side of the value chain? So, like women in the global north, basically. Yes. How can we align um, in solidarity? Like, how can how we can we be in solidarity with mm. these women? Uh, hi, I'm Talita from Brazil. Uh, I would like to know uh, what's the role of agroecology towards food security in these countries? Because if you consider Brazil, the monoculture is not responsible for feeding the population. Uh, so if a commit for the commitment to agroecology would like enhance food security, how important it can be to this kind of issue? Okay, um, Linda, yes, a, a big question. <laughs> what can we do here? Many things, but <laughs> um, regarding the value chain, yes, there are very much many initiatives that you surely know about fair trade and how can we build some more just um, uh, value chains. Um, um, I would also <laughs> provoke you to say that there are also some transnational feminist movements that are the kind of things that women here in the, the global north may do. But yes, we are all interrelated. That may be the point that we want to make. I mean, speaking about coffee, we all drink, many of us, the majority of us are drinking, are, are drinking coffee and I drink coffee two or three times a day, and my coffee does not always come from an agro agroecological coffee. So it's very difficult because the structures of the, the global markets are here. So the, the point is, is uh, how, how are we able to, 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 un, to, to support those uh, chains which are a little bit more fair than, than those very conventional. But then we have to look into details and um, at least as a consumers, we have some uh, economic power, a little bit of economic powers. And uh, Talita, um, I, I, um, I have not the figures here of, of um, the, the exact figures of um, of monoculture production and family farming. I would say family farming in that case more than agroecology and uh, uh, contribution to food security. But there are many projects uh, like beans, like um, vegetables, like 
foods which, which are coming heavily from family farming in Brazil. Of course, you have the big crops about uh, corn crops and, and so on who come from monocultures, that's clear. Um, but you have to, to, to remember also that, that very easy figure that uh, family farming is 20% of land in Brazil and 8% of, product of, of, uh, of the units of production. So you have a huge discrepancy between the land that is occupied and, um, and the, 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 the number of people who are involved. So when you have family farming, you have, <laughs> as a matter of wool, a much more um, intensive, in the positive sense, use of land with much more uh, plantations or cultivations than on a very huge uh, uh, surface. And then there's another aspect in food security that we should be concerned of, which is really uh, which food are we speaking of? Comida de verdade. I mean, uh, food security is about food quantity, <coughs> but it is also about food quality. And sincerely, I'm, I'm very much concerned about that new liberalization of, of pesticides. It's, it's a kind of molecular contamination. We have no idea. If you read Larissa's work on, uh, on, 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 on the impact of pesticides in Brazil, I think maybe you won't return to Brazil because you <laughs> will not want to, to eat. I mean, it's so difficult today to escape that kind of contamination of the old foods. So food security for me is also very much about that kind of quality. And here there is no doubt that that kind of practice that agroecology is, is talking about is <coughs> actually inevitable. Otherwise we will die. <laughs> People are dying. Uh, yes. Has any other questions? Friday evening. <laughs> Thank you very much. It has been a pleasure. And, um,